The purpose of this video is to very quickly introduce the conditions for static equilibrium and then solve a couple typical examples. The first example has just a point mass suspended from strings. And the second example has an extended body. It's a rod with a hinge at one end and a string holding it up. And we're trying to find the force exerted by the hinge and the force exerted by the string. So static equilibrium is very simple because it's literally the study of things that don't move. So what does it take for something to not move? It better have zero net force on it. So if I sum all of the vector forces on the object, it better add up to zero. Secondly, even if the net force is zero, you can imagine a case where something started spinning because the net torque wasn't zero. So I need the net torque to be zero so the object doesn't start spinning. And the cool thing about the second equation is that I'm allowed to choose any rotation axis I want. So about any axis. No matter what axis I choose, the torque better be zero about it, otherwise it would start spinning around that axis. So as we get deeper into equilibrium problems, we'll see examples where you might save a lot of work by cleverly choosing a particular rotation axis, or you might even choose multiple rotation axes throughout the course of a problem in order to generate equations to solve for the unknowns. One last thing I wanted to put into this introductory slide is just a reminder that gravity exerts a torque on an, on an extended body as if all of the mass has been concentrated at the center of mass. So what I did in this picture, I already put it in. I put the force of gravity mg for the entire rod. I attach that to the center of the rod. And now when I compute the torque exerted by gravity, maybe with respect to this rotation axis, I would pretend the force of gravity is entirely concentrated at that one point. In this example, I'm trying to solve for the tension T1 in the left string, T2 in the right string. I'm given these two different angles for those forces. And this is not a rigid body. It's not an extended body. So the notion of torque doesn't even apply to this problem. If we want to investigate equilibrium, we just say, well, the net force better be zero. And that means in the x direction and y direction independently. So the sum of all the forces horizontally better be zero. Otherwise, it would accelerate horizontally. The sum of all the forces vertically better be zero. Otherwise, it would accelerate vertically. So before I go ahead and write those equations down, I'm going to decompose these tilted vectors into horizontal and vertical components. So there's T2 horizontal, and that would be T2 cosine 25. Here's T2 vertical. That's T2 sine 25. Here's T1 horizontal. That's a T1 cosine 45. And T1 vertical. That's a T1 sine 45. All right, now I'm ready to do my horizontal and vertical analyses. And for the horizontal equations, um, the sum of all the forces acting horizontally has to be zero. You could call this one positive and this one negative and show their sum and say that it has to be equal to zero. Uh, but it's just as true to say it this way. I could say that the leftward forces better add up to the same number as the rightward forces. That means the vector sum is going to be zero. And it's a little bit quicker to write it that way. If I look in the y direction, I have two forces up, T1 sine 45 plus T2 sine 25. And those have to be equal to the force downward on this thing. Well, I have a mass of one kilogram. Gravity is pulling down on it with a magnitude of mg. That's one kilogram times 9.8 meters per second squared, which is 9.8 newtons. So the sum of these two upward components here, it better add up to the same magnitude as gravity pulling downward, which was 9.8 newtons. Now I have a system of two equations and two unknowns. So in principle, I'm done with the problem. It's just a matter of doing a little bit of algebra. So what I'm going to do is take this first equation, the x equation, and solve for t2. So I'm taking a substitution approach here. And that's t1 times cosine 45 over cosine 25. And I'm going to go ahead and move to decimal approximations at this point. So I have 0.780. When I evaluate those cosines, so T2 is 0 0.780 T1. And then I'm going to sub that into the second equation. So I have T1 sine 45 
plus T2 sine 25, but T2 is 0 0.780 T1 equals 9.8. All right, then I can uh, factor the T1 out of the left-hand side and combine sine 45 plus 0 0.780 sine 25. And when I do that, I get 1.037. Then simply solve for T1 by dividing by its coefficient. And I get that T1 is equal to 9.45 newtons. Then I go back to my original substitution and I can quickly get T2. So T2 is 0 0.780 T1. So plug in T1, 0 0.780 times 9.45. And I find out that T2 is equal to 7.37 newtons. All right, in this second example, I have a rod with a length of 5 meters and a mass of 200 kilograms. And it's being held up against gravity by a combination of a hinge at one end and a string at the other end. So in the first question, I want the tension in the string. And I'm going to do a very common trick for this. I'm going to look at a torque analysis, and I'm going to do that with a rotation axis right on the hinge, not just because it looks like it's physically capable of rotating there. That doesn't matter. You can choose the rotation axis anywhere you want. But putting the rotation axis right on the hinge makes the lever arm zero. And that means the torque exerted by the hinge is out of our equations. So let's do a torque analysis around the left end. I know the net torque must add up to zero. Another way of saying that is any clockwise torque, if I add all those up, I should get the same total as if I add up all the counterclockwise torques. Again, I'm using this, this green rotation axis here as my reference point for all the torques. So what's going clockwise? Well, that's the torque exerted by gravity. Again, that operates at the center of mass of the rigid body. So I have a total mass of 200 kilograms. Multiply by 9.8 meters per second squared. And I get 1,960 newtons for the force of gravity. And that's already perpendicular to the lever arm. And so I'm going to take, to get my clockwise torque, a force of 1,960 newtons and multiply by a lever arm of 2.5 meters. What about my counterclockwise torque? So I have the string attached at the 4 meter mark, and it's exerting this tension perpendicular to the lever arm. And the size of the lever arm, again, was 4.0 meters. And there are no other forces exerting a torque with respect to the rotation axis that I chose. Again, the force exerted by the hinge is out of the picture for this equation because the lever arm is zero for that rotation axis. All right, smash these numbers. Divide by 4.0, solve for T. And I get a tension of 1,225 newtons. In part B, I want to get the force exerted by the hinge. So I need to have some equation that actually involves that hinge force. Now, first off, I wanted to say it definitely has no horizontal component because I've mapped out every other force in the problem, and they're all vertical. If the hinge had a horizontal component to its force, the whole system would start to accelerate horizontally. So automatically, that's out of the picture. I know it's going to be a vertical force. And in my picture, I showed it pointing upward, which I'm pretty confident that it does. Um, if I turn out to be wrong, I'll just get a minus sign on it. And I'm going to look at the fact that the sum of all the forces in the y direction must add up to zero. And another way of saying that is all the upward stuff has to equal the downward stuff. So I have the hinge force, y component, plus the tension also pointing up is equal to mg pulling down. And this will guarantee that I have balance in the y direction, so I won't end up with a y acceleration. So the hinge force in the y direction is, is going to be mg minus t. 1960 minus 1225 and I get the force exerted by the hinge as 735 newtons.